We welcome Mr. Elvin Wang Graylin to share with us AI plus XL to the rescue. Elvin, please. Hi, uh, good morning. I think uh, we're, I'm going to be a little bit different than a lot of the other talks. Is I'm going to talk a little bit more about the future and a little bit less about what we've been doing for uh, the you know in the past, and a little bit less about our company because I, I think the the world right now is in a very uh, precarious place because the next five to ten years can really determine where humanity will go for the next thousand years. So uh, you know the the reason I pick this picture to start with is because you know we're talking about supercomputing so it, it brings me to uh, think about uh, superheroes so I want uh, us all to think about a superhero theme in terms of how we're going to deal with the crisis that's going to be looming um, so I was originally told I had 20 minutes but now I've been given 15 minutes although this clock says 10 so I'm gonna go pretty fast and I'll probably skip uh, a few of the slides so why, why do I think the world is going to be uh, changing dramatically in the next 10 years? It's because all of the exponential technologies that's been in sci-fi movies and books for the last century are now all coming to fruition <clears throat> at the same time. Everything is maturing, and these technologies are going to you know, make us live longer. It's going to make us smarter, make energy essentially free, and give us unlimited worlds for us to, uh, to inhabit. So I'm going to focus more on artificial intelligence and on XR uh, metaverse because I think, uh, well, that's where my background's more in. But uh, you know, I, I follow technology over the last 50 years uh, in terms of being part of all of these different transitions. So I'm not as uh, scared or excited about what's coming on because naturally technology progresses. And naturally, these type of waves are going to disrupt our lives. If we look back over the last 120 years or so, essentially every major technology uh, in terms of the media side has led to an uh, increase and in, in complexity in terms of our content. And going from you know, text to one-dimensional um, sound and music to two-dimensional video, to then interactive video and then now immersive experiences. And uh, you know, devices are getting much smaller and uh, thinner than they've ever been. You know, I don't know if you guys know, but a lot of people uh, think that XR VR devices are still big boxes. They're really now more like this. They're just like glasses, like goggles. And you can do VR, you can do AR on the same device. And I think that, that changes everything. And all of these devices here that's on the screen are from some of the biggest players in the world. And they all allow for AR, VR, and MR capabilities on the same device. So over the last 100 years, you would think that uh, with all the screens that are coming in our lives, you know, 100 years ago, we actually had no screens. And, you know, it's hard to think, because right now we have so many screens that, that are part of our lives. But 100 years ago, we had no screens. And every few decades, we've been adding screens. And looking at this trend, you're going to think we're going to have a ton of more screens going into our lives in the future. The, the reality is that we're going to have screens being replaced, and we're going to go to back to where we came from, which is having no screens. In fact, uh, longer term, if uh, Elon Musk has his way, we're going to have chips in our head, and we'll go back to, uh, <laughs> back to exactly no screens again. Um, but the screens and the media has definitely changed in terms of how uh, we've been consuming it. You know, uh, it used to be the bigger screens used to take a lot more of our lives, and now it looks like the mobile screen is taking a lot more, and our traditional screens are actually going down. That, that trend is becoming quite clear uh, in terms of the uh, traditional media losing our time of day, uh, and mobile uh, increasingly uh, taking more of our hours. I, I'm, I've been looking at my hours a day of looking at screen time on my phone, and it's probably close to nine or 10 hours a day that I'm looking at this little tiny screen, which is probably not great for my eyes. In the next decade, though, we're going to start having a shift. We're going to have something that's going to be on our eyes, uh, on our head, essentially our entire day. And that screen will continually replace more and more of the screens that we've been used to. Um, in fact, the trend will probably go to where our 
from the time we wake up, we're going to put on the glasses, and these glasses, you know, will not just be something that fixes our eyesight or gives us something to see, but it will actually make us smarter. It will all, it will turn us all into super intelligent animals or beings because it will give you whatever information you want at the time you need it and, and be personalized to you. So AI has been the topic that's been on you know, everybody's lips today or the last few days and actually probably the last year. Um, but a lot of people associate it with just text, with you know, essentially the large language models of ChatGPT. That that's actually just a very small portion of what AI represents. In fact, the AI models that are already being built today are multimodal AI models, which means they can uh, make music, they can make pictures, they can make videos, and very soon they will be able to make virtual worlds. They will be able to create the inhabitants that, uh, that populate these virtual worlds. Right. And this is just the generative AI that's been the you know, kind of popular topic in the last few years. But uh, AI has been around for 50, 60 years, and traditional AI has been part of our daily lives. We just don't really realize it because it hasn't had an interface like ChatGPT that's been so easy or mid-journey that's been so easy to use. So um, I'm going to do a little experiment with you guys. So um, there's a type of, of AI called the fusion model. Right? It's something where it takes a little bit of information and it helps to create something more complex from it. So if you look at this, uh, what do you see? Uh, probably just some Lego blocks. But I want you to squint your eyes a little bit. Just squint your eyes uh, so you see a very little bit of it from your eyes. You probably will see a very different image. Right? Uh, can anybody tell me what they see? What's that? Van Gogh, exactly. So, I mean, if you look at it if, from a high level, it looks just like a few blocks. But your eyes essentially takes the little bit of information that comes from it and, uh, and associates it with something that's already in your memory. This is how uh, the, the, the things like stable diffusion or mid-journey work. I'm going to do another experiment with you. And uh, who can read this? If you can read this, uh, take you know, 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and see if you can read that. OK. It probably starts a little hard, but it gets a lot easier. Now, why, why can you read this, even though it is not normal words? Because this is actually taking the same model of the transformer model of helping predict the next word. By predicting it, it doesn't really matter what you see. You can predict what it's going to say. Right. So if, if you look at it this way, our minds actually works very much like the AI models that are out there today. Right. So it's not that complex. And, and the reason that those work is because it's based on how our brains and our, how our nervous system works. This is the, the growth chart of AI parameters over the last you know, uh, 50, 60 years. This looks like an exponential chart. But what a lot of people don't realize is that this is actually already a log scale. So this is an exponential chart on a log scale. And we're already getting to where the parameter counts are at the same order of magnitude as the number of nerve cells in our brain. In fact, within the next two or three years, we're going to get to the, the uh, order of magnitude of the number of synapses in our brain. Now, you know, we're talking about supercomputing, so I wanted to put this up because this is about the um, amount of growth in terms of compute that's being used for creating these uh, AI models. Right? This again is an exponential chart, uh, and it looks you know, exponential growth. What, uh, you know, what was talked about earlier with you know, quantum computing and so forth, it was you know, Moore's law. Moore's law essentially is you know, doubling every you know, month, uh, every year to year and a half. Uh, I used to work with Intel. So, um, but that's actually it's slowing down to probably every two years or so. Right? So if you look at just Moore's law, it's not very fast. Over 10 years, you would expect it to grow five to, uh, you know, uh, actually, over 10 years, if it doubles every year, it'll go to 1,000x, right? But it normally is probably in the, in the half of that. What this is showing is that over the last 10 years, we've gone growth by 1 billion x, okay, of how much compute is being used to power these AI, uh, to compute these AI models. So we are definitely growing a lot faster than people expect. This is the uh, chart on terms of the theory of mind, how these models understand who they're talking to. And, and using the, 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 the subject person who's asking these questions to be able to, to account for uh, how to respond. Three years ago, 
there was essentially almost no theory of mind in any of the large language models. And now we're getting to the 90 to 100 percentile. You know, so just within three years, these models have gone from essentially dumb, completely dumb uh, models to uh, children of you know, 10 years or, or older. Here's a, uh, a, a chart that actually grows even faster than the prior charts. Right? You know, over the last 10 years or so, or five, six years, essentially the tokens uh, count, which is the number of words you can put in your input in your questions. Right? If you put a, a, a sentence, that's probably like 20 or 30 tokens. You know? But uh, you know, some of these systems now can actually account for putting in 100,000 tokens, which is about 70,000 words I can put into a question. Or I can put in a report and say, summarize this. But recently, there's been papers out that allow you to put a billion tokens. A billion tokens, just to give you a little context, is that's about how many words an average human will hear, speak, and read in their entire life. So you can put the entire corpus of the interactions of a human in their life and put it uh, into a model today and it will give you a, a relevant output. So back to the, 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 uh, the superhero concept, right? A lot of people play games. Why do they play games? Because they want to be immersed in their own worlds. They want to be a hero of their world, right? Now, beyond being a hero, we can also talk about um, mythical mythical creatures. And AI has been associated with mythical creatures in the sense of uh, being a centaur, right? Uh, the human becoming, uh, having the brain controlling it, but powered by AI. That, that's how we've been using AI for the last you know, 50, 60 years. You're know, using it to help us, right? People have probably heard of centaur chess, where uh, people use a computer to guide you to play chess against each other. Uh, when when uh, Kasparov was beat by uh, Deep Blue, people thought, oh, chess is over. But then for the next five or so years after that, people actually did centaur chess, and they got to play at an even higher level. But now we're getting to a point where centaur chess uh, actually doesn't even matter anymore because we are getting to minotaur chess. <laughs> because uh, AI essentially by itself will outplay any human plus machine combination in almost any game, any finite game. And what people are afraid of now is that what happens is, will, will AI be able to manipulate us and control us as humans and just making us their slaves, their bodies to, to, to execute their, their, their will? So there are definitely risks associated with AI. I, I talk about the power of it to help make us more productive. But uh, you know, the, the biggest fears, I think, are actually probably un, less founded than people think. You know, the, the biggest risk people talk about is, you know, AI takeover, the terminators. You know, you'll get machines that will take over the world. Or you have an alignment problem where a, 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 an AI is smart enough to be able to destroy the world but doesn't understand what we mean and, and inadvertently destroys the world. The, the ones that are probably more likely and more eminent is the job displacement issue. We're going to have 50, 60, 70 percent of the population uh, lose their jobs in the next decade. How, you know, and I don't think we will be able to manufacture enough new jobs as we have in prior industrial revolutions, right? Prior industrial revolutions took between 70 to 40 years to play out. We're going to have this play out in the next five to 10 years. The, the, the society today does not have the power to create new employment for these roles. The other uh, issue is the misuse, misinformation, and manipulation of AI. And, because it's going to be much more smarter, much more informed, and be able to create and be able to personalize this message to individuals, it will be able to essentially manipulate us to, to buy things, to vote for things, to go places, to do things that we may or may not have wanted. Right? So that is a, a very real uh, risk. But I'm not afraid of AI doing this on its own. Um, what I'm afraid of is that there will be bad actor humans that will take this technology and be able to give it a, a uh, negative purpose. Right? So we definitely need uh, to have proper regulation to, to solve these issues. The job impact problem, you know, if you look at some of the, the uh, published reports, essentially it's able to outdo us on almost every major intellectual task out there today, or at least outdo 90% of the, of the experts in, in the field. And that, this is from about a year ago almost, uh, probably nine, 10 months ago. Uh, within another, you know, uh, half a year to a year, it will probably be able to get past 100 percent of the humans. Um, and the jobs that are being most impacted are actually the high wage jobs. It's the, the jobs that we used to think were the safest. 
Uh, in fact, if you look at the jobs report in terms of the impact of which sectors, it's the, the, you know, the translators, the mathematicians, the accountants, the lawyers, those are the ones that are going to be replaced the fastest. And the ones that are safest, safest are the carpenters, the dishwashers, the massage therapists, and so forth. Right, so if you want your kids to have a, a stable job, they may actually want to go more towards the service sector. <laughs> um, I'm going to go even faster now. Um, if you look at uh, productivity over time, you know, technology has helped us to become more productive and having less hours. So you know, if you look at this trend, actually, we would probably expect that, oops, oh, I think I took one of the slides out. Um, but you would have thought that, hey, you know, back then when, when we were uh, medieval or hunter-gatherer, we would have uh, been spending all our time working. Actually, that's not the case. If they went back and looked at how do hunter-gatherers uh, live, they only work about 1,000 hours a, a year in terms of uh, helping them survive. You know, we're actually, the Industrial Revolution made us work a lot more than what's natural. Um, if you look at in terms of productivity over uh, over uh, income, the higher the productivity, uh, the, the 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 higher the income, the lower the hours of work. So if you take that trend to its to its maximum, essentially what we get to is all of us will not need to work in a very short time. So let's talk a little bit about the metaverse. Uh, what is it? Because it's there's a lot of confusion out there. And I think the easy way to think about it, it is the 3D version of the internet that we've been building for the last 30 years, powered by AI, and then using XR devices, you know, things like, like this. But in a few years, it will look more like this, right? And in a few more years, it will probably be embedded. And uh, I actually talked to uh, Neil Stevenson, who coined the word, and I asked him, does this make sense to you? And he said, yeah, this, this actually makes a lot of sense, it's, and it's easy to remember. I'm going to skip this slide, but uh, essentially, without AI, the metaverse would not be possible, because everything that makes the metaverse the metaverse requires high-quality AI behind it. Um, and uh, you know, HTC is actually not just a manufacturer of hardware. We're actually also doing the, pl the back-end platform to create an open metaverse. Um, maybe I should, I'll skip this just to save time. But essentially, the high level, uh, the high level story of this slide is that over time, our, our productivity increases, and our key um, asset or resource has been different, going from livestock to land to transportation to labor to automation, etc. But when we started, our only asset was time, and very soon, our only asset uh, resource, limited resource, will also be time. So our productivity has gone up over the last thousand years by 6,000 times, and it's going to go in just over the last few years have actually gone up another few thousand uh, times. So you would think that with that, our, our equality or the Gini index, which is the, the, the level of stratification uh, between countries, would be very even, but actually it's not. We have a very big range in terms of where the, um, the equality uh, within the country is. But what's even more uh, maybe disturbing is actually the global inequality level is higher than the worst offending inequality levels of countries like South Africa or some of the, the other um, uh, worst nations. And it's actually even worse than what it was back uh, during the Industrial Revolution and, and during the medieval uh, serf and, uh, and slave days. Uh, I think I'm going to skip this, but essentially, in the higher, what data shows is that the higher the income, the higher our happiness, okay? And, you know, when we talk about superheroes, instead of wanting to be superheroes, most children now want to be either, uh, you know, YouTube influencers or they want to be billionaires, right? So, I, what I want to remind people, though, is that we shouldn't be looking at a billionaire in terms of a dollars that you have. We should be looking at billionaires in terms of the time you have, because every single person in this room and on this earth has about two billion seconds in our life. Okay, so we are all billionaires, and we are all as equal as any, anybody else, much, much better than what you saw in the prior chart in terms of the financial di distribution. You know, some people, the top 1%, actually the top few hundred, uh, the top like 50 or 100 people own more wealth than the bottom 50% of the entire population. This is, this is, we, we live in a very unequal world, but in the world where time is the currency, we are all equal. So 
I'm going to skip this. I think everybody knows this. I'm going to skip the utopia talk because I think we, we all want to get to utopia, but I think it's an, impossible, uh, it's an impossible target. What we should be targeting is protopia. So protopia is something that, that Kevin Kelly um, uh, proposed a few years ago. And what that is is that we don't have to get to the perfect world because the perfect world does not exist and is not stable. What we should try to do is to make a world that is better than yesterday. And every day, you do something better than yesterday. I'm going to skip this one. Uh, if you're interested, send me an email. I'll send you the slide. But it, it talks about the key, some key macro trends. So I will just go to my last couple of slides, which is we right now have a real responsibility to our children, to their children, to their children's children. Because what we do in the next five years as a society, as leaders in this industry, will determine how their lives will come, come out. So we have, a, 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 with, you know, with our great power in terms of our timing, we have great responsibility. And I would really urge all of you to think more about what you will do with this next few years, because those years are going to really matter. So uh, thank you. I hope uh, this was uh, helpful. Thank you, Elvin.